So um, thank you, Chris. Where's Chris? Thank you for the invitation. It's quite an honor for me to be invited to a meeting like this. Uh, um, I'm just a doctor who just sees patients, and this is sort of a hobby that's become more than a full-time job kind of thing. Um, looking at applying what we know about sleep from the shift work research that I did with the Calgary Police Service to the athletes. And so that's sort of my background is working with police and shift work. And uh, once that project closed down, I was asked to work with the group of sports scientists at the University of Calgary. Um, and I, I'm not part of this sort of culture. Um, so it is, again, thank you very much for the invitation because this is probably the funnest part of my job is working with the athletes and doing this uh, work. So I was asked to keep it very practical. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do. And um, we've also switched things up uh, to uh, add a bit about jet lag uh, at the end of the talk. So um, I hope this is of value to you folks. So I'm going to talk about the uh, sleep recovery and regeneration program that uh, I was asked to put together for the University of Calgary and the Canadian uh, Sports Centre system, which is developing a national strategy for the management of sleep and long-term athlete development. So this is a collaboration between the Canadian Olympic Committee and Sport Canada through a program called Sport for Life. And embedded in that is the long-term athlete development program. So looking at, again, a national strategy to uh, come up with techniques and, uh, for training and developing athletes from childhood all the way through to the podium uh, and beyond. Uh, and so people were interested in the relationship of sleep. And you guys are interested in sleep, which I find fascinating as well, because I don't know if sleep is important. I, I'm not as convinced as other people, but we'll see. Um, so, you know, I have to do all these disclosures. I have no, nothing to disclose. I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm not here to sell you sleep, actually. Um, and I'm, uh, obviously, I get an honorarium for coming here, but uh, no other fees or anything like that. It's part of a series that is copyrighted. And I always give this disclaimer to everybody about sleep. And that is, if your athletes go to bed, fall asleep within 30 minutes, sleep through the night with brief awakenings, feel refreshed, within one hour of waking up, most days, five out of seven days a week, then your athletes are normal sleepers, okay? Don't listen to anything that I say, because it will make no difference. So I'm not in the business of looking for problems. I'm in the business of making sure that we re reassure athletes they're fine and get on with training. So I want to be really clear about that, because I'm not hysterical um, ab about sleep issues. I, I always joke around that I think the Americans will leave the hysteria to them because <clears throat> they can find a problem anywhere. <clears throat> so when we finish here, you'll have a clear understanding of the relationship of sleep to recovery and regeneration from my perspective, what I think the role of sleep is when it comes to recovery and regeneration. And you'll be able to implement a sleep screening program for your athletes wherever you are. And um, actually, I'm just wondering, you've really turned the lights down, and I think that's going to make everybody fall asleep. In, including me. Can we turn the lights up just a little bit? There we go. Okay. And you'll be able to implement an assessment and intervention strategies for your teams and individual athletes. So I want you to go away with something that you can use with your teams uh, and your athletes. So why would we even think about screening athletes when it comes to sleep? And I'm, after listening to this morning, it became quite apparent to me that Actually, a lot of the research that's going on isn't really including what I would call sleep screening. So I think that's very important. And it's just applying basic principles of sleep and making assumptions about research that's been done in other areas like law enforcement, the military, aviation, and whatnot, and assuming that athletes are the same as the others, which we can make some assumptions about that. But we also have to understand that athletes, and elite athletes in particular, are very different than the average individual, and certainly different even from high-performing uh, people such as police officers or people in the military. They're very different. So we have to be careful about applying what we know about sleep in other areas to athletes. So we have to have a clinical relevance. There has to be some reason to screen athletes for sleep, because my assumption when I was asked to help was they're athletes, they're kids, they're fine. Don't worry about it. They all sleep fine. So that was my immediate assumption when I was asked to get involved. 
So that may not be the case, and we found that maybe it isn't the case, and you'll see where some of the data goes on that. <clears throat> then you have to have theoretical principles, and I think that's vastly missing in the current literature. And that is, what are the theoretical principles around which you're going to base your screening and your research so that you can go forward and get valuable answers? Okay? And then you have to apply it practically. And you have to determine whether the tools you're using to evaluate sleep objectively and subjectively are relevant, valid, and reliable. So these things are all very shaky in the sleep and sport business, just so you know. And I'm quite happy for people to challenge me on these things and ask lots of questions about this too. Okay? So from a clinical relevance perspective, it's about recovery and regeneration, that relationship. So the, the good sports science is finding out what those relationships are by looking at hard markers, performance markers. And the problem is the methodologies in the, in, in the sleep part are a bit weak in being able to draw strong conclusions. But again, we're early in the game, so we're, we're finding our way through this. From my point of view, the clinical relevance is important in case finding. So in other words, what, what I thought was true uh, in the first five years didn't seem to be true, and now I'm pretty sure it is true, is that there's a very low prevalence of sleep problems in athletes, in spite of other things that have been published recently. But when you find a problem and you fix it, it has a high impact. That's a clinical thing. That's not research. That's clinical. So when a coach has a good athlete or a trainer, or, and they want to see that athlete make it from 12, because they can see the talent, to 20, so swimmers would be a good example of that, where you need a lot of years before you hit the podium, you've got to get them there. And one of the things that coaches and trainers will tell you about swimmers, for instance, is they fall off the curve around their late teens, maybe early 20s, because they can't sustain what's needed to get to the podium in their mid-20s for most swimmers, for instance. And so it's looking at that, the long-term ability to sustain the training and the competitive schedules and all the travel to get to the final goal. And so you want to be able to find those athletes early in their career. So that's the point. That's the clinical point. And if you can treat them, there's a huge impact. Okay? So that's the goal clinically. So we came up with this model based on what we'd done from police and law enforcement. We developed a way of conceptualizing, and that's what I would say is probably relevant here for you guys, is to look at this from a resiliency perspective and then a wellness perspective. Because just, I, I'm a physician, my sport medicine colleagues are physicians, and they're concerned about the health of the athletes. Not just, you know, if you sleep restrict them, what's their muscle strength like or their endurance. We want them to be healthy. And again, they sustain huge travel loads depending on what kind of athlete they are. Professional athletes tend to have higher frequency, shorter distance if in, in our sports, like hockey. Whereas the um, uh, amateur athletes tend to go far distances, but fewer times that they travel through the year. And those, are, they, those have different implications. And so I'm interested in the health and wellness. And what's the role of sleep when we look at health and wellness? And then what's the role of sleep when it comes to resilience? In other words, the resilience is what you guys are talking about from the point of view of training loads. Like how can you increase training loads or how can you modify uh, training and recovery to improve the outcome? So that to me is resilience. That's my perspective on things. Okay? And so what are the sleep factors? So this would be, for instance, sleep debt, total amount of sleep, circadian factors. So those would be not only travel, shifting in time zones, but this whole concept of a delayed phased kid. So a teenager who's a night owl is going to have a problem acquiring the total amount of sleep to get good recovery out of their sleep, for instance. So these things are important. And that's independent of jet lag. For, that's a whole other problem. Okay? And time zone displacement, where jet lag doesn't play a role, but you're within, let's, from my perspective, within North America, just moving two time zones east or two time zones west, not very far, but that can have an impact. And then, of course, the life factors, just the, the whole concept of how does life get, get in here and mess everything up. And it improves a coping threshold. So this is the way we look at shift work, for instance. And then on the other side, health and wellness, we look at nutrition and hydration, 
training factors and then life factors and how they impact sleep, just getting enough sleep. And I think Greg made the point today about, you know, what do you do when they get home late from the game? They got to get up early to go and, and uh, do a training session or with the coach post game. And you're just really messing things up. So this is a way to conceptualize at the end of the day, what do you have left over here when it comes to sleep? What's the role of sleep in this whole um, uh, equation and set of factors? So the theoretical principles, and I think at the end of the day, if you leave here with just one thing, you got to know this when it comes to sleep, okay? It's all about total sleep time, the amount, sleep quality, and then the timing of sleep. So focus yourself on those three concepts, and in my view, research should revolve around those three theoretical concepts. And again, I'm open for discussion, you know. But the total sleep time is affected by nighttime sleep, naps, and then the impact of travel, sleep quality, sleep disorders. And that's something that's missing from the sleep screening that's going on currently. Okay? And that's important. Finding out if the kids have sleep disorders, because they do. And if they're fixed, it makes a huge difference for the athlete. So primary sleep disorders, non-restorative sleep, where they sleep, so no one detects a problem, but they wake up unrested all the time. And keep in mind, you're dealing with an athlete whose reason for being unrested can be quite simple. They're training. So we have to be very careful. Okay? And then again, sleep quality can be affected by travel. The sleep timing is a circadian factor, and the big one in, in the population that you're dealing with is specifically at Aspire, is delayed sleep phase, where their sleep phase gets moved okay, later, typical of teenagers, and in that age range, not only do they require more sleep per night, they're getting less because of the delay in the sleep phase and then having to go to school in the morning. So there's a big problem there that's often missed. And then, of course, when it comes to sleep timing, travel and jet lag. Okay. So from my point of view, when I sat down with the group, I said, look, we don't know a thing about athletes' sleep. And we need some way of figuring it out first, because I don't even know if there's a problem. And so it was developing a way to screen athletes, because all of the screening tools, of which there are a multitude, have never been validated in an athlete population. So we have no idea. And so that was our project, and that's what we got funded to do, was to develop a valid, reliable, and effective method of screening. And so we used item analysis, factor analysis, and developed a simple psychometric tool we have an implementation strategy, and then we have a comprehensive intervention strategy behind that. So that's what I'm going to sort of start with. And this is the athlete sleep screening questionnaire. And so this, is, this has been about six years in the making and ten years altogether working with the group, but uh, not to read this or anything, but this is just the poster of our sort of last stage of developing the questionnaire and the items in the questionnaire that have some reasonable degree of validity that we can go forward with large-scale screening of the athletes. And so what we came up with was a series of items, I, I think it's down to 23 items, that give us a sleep difficulty score. Because keep in mind, we have to do a national screening of a large population of athletes and come up with a simple tool that gives us an answer, do this or don't do this, and that's it. So that was our goal. And we wanted to retain the concepts, the theoretical concepts of sleep quality, total sleep time. And then what we came out with at the end of this long process was insomnia seemed to be the most pre prevalent problem that we could detect in our early stage of doing the uh, validity and reliability testing. We put chronotype in because uh, it there were, it wasn't strong, it, we didn't have strong validity for the items used, but I felt so strongly that it was important to detect that we keep it in as a modifying factor in the questionnaire. And at the end of the day, the sleep difficulty score discriminates between whether referring the athlete for evaluation or no referral. And I'll show you what happens on either side of that coin. We put a travel component in, two questions that look at travel, and these are modifiers, so travel, chronotype, and then sleep apnea. 
because sleep apnea would be very low prevalence but very high impact. So if we could find one athlete who stopped breathing in their sleep, so we've had, you know, these are usually power athletes, uh, like uh, sliding athletes in bobsled and whatnot, or weightlifters, where they'll stop breathing 30, 40 times a night in their sleep, okay? They'll desaturate, their oxygen saturations are low, and of course, amongst their population, they're just the snoring guy that nobody wants to sleep with when they travel, but that's not it. They have a sleep disorder, and when you fix it, it makes a huge difference in their ability to train and respond to training and recover. So we keep sleep apnea in there as part of the questionnaire. And we have a network across the country of sports centers that we can deploy the screening through and the integrated support teams for all of the teams, the Olympic teams, and all of the Paralympic teams. So the sleep screening is done through each uh, uh, section across the country. We have key locations where sleep is dealt with across the country, Vancouver, Calgary, Montreal, and Toronto. And we have key sport doctors that are trained to address sleep issues for the athletes across the country. So this has taken us a long time to train all of these people, and it's me going across the country on the dog and pony show, giving lots of talks, and educating the doctors and the athletes so that we embed this into the culture of sport in, in the whole system. And we're now at the point where it's now part of the system. Okay. And I have specific sleep physicians across the country who will see athletes that we identify need special attention. So this is basically putting it all together. The ISTs that are using us now are limited because we're just building this program out. And so we get a lot of interest from cycling, freestyle skiing, and it's more about just getting each team on board as we uh, move along. At the end of the day, this is all done online and we have it, we collect all the data at our site okay, through an online and any athlete can just go online, they get a key, they get a, a login and a password and they just go fill out the questionnaire and then this is what happens after. Okay, so they do the questionnaire, we get the results, I review them and then we send a letter back to the doctor and it gives them advice as to what needs to happen with the athlete. And we will do a Skype follow-up with them and arrange for them to see myself or one of the other sleep doctors across the country if we decide that that's where it has to go. So that gives a quick overview of what the program is. And we are eliminating all of the problems right up front and educating the athletes that don't have a problem and finding the athletes that do have a problem and getting them help. In addition to that, we have the Canadian Athlete Monitoring Program. So now each athlete for all of the teams has an electronic medical record basically where they enter in their daily training stuff. Um, and we have the sleep questionnaires embedded in that and they actually log their total sleep time every day in there. So we're starting to have a database, a collective place where we can pull all the data and start to do some analysis and that's what we're going to do moving forward, looking at patterns on large groups of athletes. So the clinical stuff that we have to date is when we've had teams say we want you to do screening, so I'm just giving you sort of a snapshot of 44 athletes from a variety of teams that have done it in the last year. And so we have 18 out of 44 were recommended to have Skype consults from the, uh, the screening. And we found things like delayed sleep phase syndrome, five athletes with moderate to severe risk for sleep apnea, so we want to send them for sleep studies, and three athletes require ongoing monitoring and support to treat insomnia, so we make arrangements for that. And, um, for instance, one athlete was identified as to be using excessive amounts of sleep medication. And you'd be surprised in your teams, especially the professional teams. Would you have a big frequency of people using drugs for sleep? Uh, Good. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So not even touch, like, you know, not even touching on that stuff in his talk, but we know what's going on in the culture. Hockey is terrible. The, so the, the Calgary Flames had a visiting team in the contract, the team had to have four cases of Red Bull 
in the locker room pre-game for the visiting team. That was part of the contract. So you wouldn't believe what these athletes are doing just to stay awake, to stay jumped up on the ice. And so this now is just a part of our validation study because we continuously collect data to validate the questionnaire. And this is sort of the first phase of 220 athletes. And this was done anonymously, so we didn't do any feedback. It wasn't clinical at all. This is just research. And basically, of the 220 athletes, just to give you an idea, no clinical problem was identified in this large 68% of the athletes. So no problem. Zero. Don't worry about it. You're fine. Mild clinical problem, 3%. And then moderate to severe, where we would want to do some intervention, maybe 30%. Okay? And again, that intervention could simply be you'll see nothing more than some education. They don't necessarily have to see the doctor. Okay? So the interventions are no clinical problem is education, mild clinical problem is education and monitoring, and I'm going to go into more detail about the monitoring. Moderate, cl moderate clinical problem would be see the sport physician, and the sport physician is trained to do sort of a basic medical assessment of their sleep issues and determine whether they need referral to the sleep physician. And then severe, we would say, don't waste your time. Just send them to a sleep doc. We'll figure it out. And so when we look at education, part of the program is this long-term athlete development program. So I put this slide up here because, in my view, this is the biggest issue for young athletes. In, in the Aspire group, for instance, and I don't know in this culture whether they're tied to their toys phones and stuff, is that correct? Sorry? Oh, sorry. Yeah? Like they're all, yeah, just like our kids? Yeah, it's terrible. Okay. So these things are evil. Like computers and cell phones are evil. I don't care. They're just awful things. Okay. So my big, you know, so this is, I'm putting it up there because I have an agenda and that agenda is get them to stop doing this, especially the athletes. And the athletes have very good reasons to be tied to their phone because when they're traveling, they want to communicate with their family, which is very reasonable, but that has to be controlled. There's a variety of reasons why these things are very toxic to sleep behavior, okay? And it's important for you people to know that because that could be the biggest piece of education that you give them is put the phone in the washing machine at 8 o'clock at night and leave it there till morning, okay? And lock the washing machine. So they can't get the damn phone. Okay, the same with the computers. Because these kids are too busy. They have to train, they have to do their school, and there's no time for all this other stuff. And yet they believe they have to stay connected. So we've done work, and, I, and there has been work done all over the world, on looking at teenagers' sleep behaviors with their cell phones. And it's shocking how many kids actually go to bed with the phone on under their pillow and answer text messages in the middle of the night. So they're living a shift worker's life or an on-call person's life as a teenager. This is very unhealthy behavior, very unhealthy. Okay? So this, I think, is really important. And this goes to, basically, we wrote a chapter for the Long-Term Athlete Development Program specifically on sleep, managing sleep from childhood all the way through to the podium. And it goes through all the, life, uh, the stages of life and what the recommendations are. And I mean, this is, you can get this online. I'm just sort of, it's broken down into age groups, girl, girls and boys, and then what the recommendations are and the key points. So that coaches and trainers have good, reliable information that they can use when they're talking. Because I mean, everybody's too busy and there's too many things to educate the kids about. But this is a simple way to do it. So this is now pretty much embedded in a national strategy. We use these books for the athletes. These are my two go-to books for the athletes because insomnia is probably the most prevalent problem from a sleep perspective, is difficulty initiating and maintaining sleep. Okay? And so we recommend this book. It's an excellent resource. And then to take a nap, change your life because I'm a big advocate of napping strategies for the athletes. Okay? And when we look at monitoring, so I want to go through these because I, I think it's really important for you to get useful information. The whole idea of monitoring athletes' sleep objectively using tools, I think there's, it's fraught with error. So to 
the act, actographs are the great, latest, greatest craze in sport monitoring is to give these kids, and I think even Nike is developing an actograph and all these other companies. And nobody knows, no one has any idea about how reliable and valid that data is on each individual athlete. So it's really important if you're going to use these devices to know their limitations. Because they have vast limitations. And they have absolutely no capacity to give you any information about the quality of anyone's sleep. The best question to ask anybody on the planet to get an accurate answer about their sleep quality is, how was your sleep last night? Just so you know. And that's actually been looked at very carefully. It is the most predictive question you can ask a human being. And it gives you the most useful information. Just so you know. You don't need an actigraph. So I use sleep logs. I will use actigraphy, and I'm going to show you what our preferred method of doing this under very specific situations. Now again, in research, it's just as researchers, we need to know limitations, but we're collecting data. And as long as we know and we talk about the limitations of the tools that we're using, that's totally reasonable. But to make decisions about training times or what we're going to do, or policy decisions about when we're going to train athletes or travel, be very careful about making those decisions based on using that tool. I think it's very important. I have, uh, I, you know, very careful about that. So the abbreviated EEG is this device that you can buy now, and now teams are buying these. I, I, and it just goes on the head, and, and it gives a printout of what your sleep quality is and, and what your sleep stages were. And again, I have a lot of problems with this as well, because it's fraught with error, these devices. And so if you're in a responsible position like the people in this room, you want to use good tools that are going to give you good information that is reliable. And that's the key. And the phone apps, totally useless. These phone apps for sleep, totally useless, especially in this population. Again, this is my view, and you can tell I'm a pretty opinionated guy. So this is our sleep blog. And basically, we just ask them to fill it out. We explain how to fill it out. But we want to get their impression of their sleep pattern. The only reason I use this is to get a picture. I want them to see, and I want to see what the picture of their sleep is. That's it. And you can also rate your sleep and how they felt, just on a Likert scale. But the bottom line is I want to see the pattern, because that's the most useful piece of information for me as a clinician to then work with the athlete. And it's amazing how useful it is for the athlete to see that back. Okay. Now, I'll use actigraphy in very specific situations with the athletes. And we may use it more now. We may start buying devices and use it more now that we have a useful questionnaire to do the baseline screening of the athletes. And we can pick the groups of athletes that are well and not well and use the device appropriately. And so this is a very good device. And a lot of research has gone into the development, the validation, the reliability testing of this device. And, um, and it's used in numerous industries. And the reason I like it, again, is the information we get back out of it. But you have to be careful about how you interpret it. So act an actigraph is simply logging motion with a three-dimensional accelerometer on the wrist. And it's just movement. That's it. So you can imagine in your own mind how fraught with error it is. And the blue areas are quiet, and that would be what we would assume is sleep. But we always use actigraphy with logs, so we have a, very, a more accurate assessment, not just the actigraphs alone. And this device has an interesting printout that gives you basically their cognitive function, prediction of their cognitive function based on the total sleep time and the time of day and the previous amount of sleep. And so it's useful for us from a research perspective. And we might be able to use it when we have teams traveling far distances just to see if it correlates to win-loss. And the group that developed this device has done that with the, um, the Vancouver Canucks. And they've looked at win-loss compared to cognitive effectiveness scale. And that's the bottom line here is that this, the, the, the cognitive effectiveness starts to drop off 
as their sleep becomes affected and they might get less sleep and also the time of day is, is incorporated into this. And at the end of the day, what you get is this basically, is a rating and a comparative scale. And so normal would be um, 90 to 100% effectiveness um, and the performance impairment would be very low whereas high risk would be down in here and the impairment would be high and you can look at blood alcohol level um, equivalences. And again, you have to be careful about how you interpret this information. And you have to know how the algorithms are designed to understand the validity and reliability of the data. But it's interesting stuff, and it is used in industry. It's used in aviation, okay, for safety and fitness for duty and whatnot. So this is just a real snapshot. I'm going quickly through this stuff. Do you guys have any questions so far? Just giving you an overview of what we've done so far with our program. No questions? You guys, it's afternoon, it's after lunch. Everybody's bored, they're dying. No questions at all? My goodness, okay. You're making my life easy. So I'm gonna give you a case, because I think this is useful. So this is uh, 2004, I saw this 17-year-old grade 12 student. She's a goalie, and she'd been recruited to the University of Toronto. So she was in her last year of high school. She presented with insomnia and was referred by a psychologist. And she had a two-year history of insomnia associated with stress. And she had a delay in her sleep phase due to evening training. So this is, again, depending on your sport, if you're training athletes in the evening, you can take a true night owl and make them much worse. Or you can take a kid who's neutral and make them a night owl. So you have to be aware of this. And so our response to what Greg was talking about with the athletes in soccer, we would actually, what we do in shift work, is make all of the athletes night owls. So we would actually shift their clocks. So they were people who now naturally would sleep between, let's say, 1 a.m. and 10 a.m. That would be their window of sleep. And we'd move the whole team, as many as we could in the team, and make them night owls. And then we'd strategically insert naps for the others that couldn't adjust to that schedule. And we would strategize each one of the athletes' sleep routines, okay? And so this girl has situational anxiety with exams and hockey. Her bedtime's 11 p.m., but it takes her more than one hour to fall asleep most nights. She wakes and becomes anxious during the night, watches the clock, and stays in bed. She gets out of bed at 8.30 a.m., usually feels okay in the morning, but gets tired as the day progresses. So she's been diagnosed with situational anxiety, and sadly, she is on a sedative for her anxiety in addition to taking a sleep medication, a sedative for bed. So this is a 17-year-old who's on two Valium-type medications, which I have huge issues with giving teenagers sedatives or drugs of any kind under any circumstance. So being a teenager, she was a frustrated, angry kid who didn't want to see the sleep doctor, so um, she didn't do very much. And, uh, went on her way. So she returned in December having gone off to university and she hadn't improved, no, no surprise. She had poor progress uh, because of her rooming situation and when she went to a private room things improved. So she was ready now, going back to second term, to focus on her sleep. So we gave her a program and I said I'd see her in the spring. So she returned in the spring and she wasn't doing so well. So this just gives me an idea of how erratic her sleep is. She's having a nap here at five o'clock, a shorter sleep here where she has some insomnia. She has a nap at six o'clock. She has broken sleep here. She has one period of solid sleep there. And then she goes back to her erratic pattern with napping. So this is a very disorganized sleep schedule for an 18 year old who's training um, in the summer post school to go back. Really disorganized. And that's not what we wanna see in an athlete. So she was ready to do the work, and, and this is not easy work for a teenager to do, but the bottom line is we give her a sleep restriction with a bedtime of between 11 and midnight and a wake time between 8 and 9. So she was used to going to the gym at 7 in the morning, and a lot of these kids will use the gym just to wake up. So they're not recovered. They're not rested. They're just using exercise to keep going. And then we gave her a nap at 2 to 3 p.m. So her total sleep time would be around 9 hours a night and she'd get a little catch up as well because she is a teenager requiring somewhere between nine and 10. 
We used light therapy in the morning to adjust her biological clock, and we adjusted her training schedule to begin between 9.30 and 10 instead of 7. So these were big changes for her. But when she came back, she was maintaining a routine. And she'd found a huge difference. And so I just want to do this uh, video just to show you. If you have a teenager at home who won't get out of bed in the morning, but won't get out of bed at night either, or won't go to bed in the night either, that is, uh, you're not alone. Many teenagers are suffering from a serious lack of sleep, and when it gets really bad, it can affect their school performance. Karen Owen has more on tonight's Medical Watch. 18-year-old Shannon Miller is heading off to hockey practice this morning, refreshed and well-rested. But it wasn't always that way. Again, how much sleep were you getting before treatment? Probably like four hours, like four or five hours. It wasn't enough. Shannon couldn't reach her potential on the ice or during class. I was drinking pop like it was going out of style, pop and coffee, like to get through class. Shannon's sleep problem isn't an isolated case. There are a lot of teenagers not getting enough sleep. But just like adults, some teenagers cope better than others. For the teenagers who are not coping, the answer may be readjusting their internal body clock or circadian rhythm. In the teen years, this body clock gets reset, making teenagers want to fall asleep later and get up later. About 20% of teenagers will experience this delay in the sleep phase where it's significant. What makes it worse is that teenagers need about 10 hours of sleep a night. Shannon Miller started using light therapy every morning to treat her delayed sleep phase syndrome. And it just moves their sleep phase backwards. So they can start actually falling asleep early earlier in the night. Yes. Shannon now aims for seven to nine hours of sleep every night and she sleeps in a little on the weekends. It really it's just math. Basically they need 70 hours of sleep per week. Shannon says getting enough sleep has made an impact at school and on the ice. I've made more games this summer than I ever have. Bottom line for many teenagers, they need to do less, like turn off the computer earlier, so they can sleep more. Karen Owen, CFCN News. So the bottom line with her is that she had a legitimate psychiatric or psychological problem with situational anxiety and she had developed a conditioned insomnia. She was physiologically a delayed phase, so that reinforces her insomnia. And she had lifestyle issues being a university student and whatnot. And when I saw her, she was in sort of an early overtraining uh, state where she really was getting kind of stale. She wasn't responding well to her training at all. And um, she wasn't able to bulk up because that's what she wanted to do. She couldn't increase her strength. Her flexibility was poor. And, she sort of had diffuse muscle discomfort. And so these are all the things that I see all the time. So I get to see the worst athletes. Like when everyone else is given up, they send them to me. And um, it can be quite depressing sometimes. So the management was to get her some insight-oriented psychotherapy. She had the single room at school. We adjusted her sleep phase using light therapy and melatonin. And um, we, um, we, we changed her training schedule and her sleep schedule. And that all of those things can't be figured out without screening the athletes properly. That's what it takes to figure that stuff out and getting them to the right person. So we download a lot of the responsibility to the trainers and the physios on the integrated support teams. So they're all trained to sort of detect early problems and then they can contact me with an email anytime and I get emails from people training all over the world and then we solve the problem and it's very easy because these kids could be on the road traveling and struggling for two or three months. And um, you know, they just, if they get some help, it makes a big difference to them, okay? So um, this, this was the main part of the talk. I don't know how much time I've got left. I tried to go fast, actually. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I like, uh, I'm, like, I like talking to people and chatting, and you guys are all dead, so. <laughs> So I don't know if you're dead because you're bored or this was bad or you spent a lot of money flying me over here from Calgary for nothing. 
So I'm here to answer any of your questions about these things. So if you guys have athletes or questions about what we do or things that you've seen, I'm happy to talk about it. Right. But for the two thirds or more or less it looks like who are normal sleepers, do we pay much attention to them and if so, what can we expect? <laughs> okay, so to answer the first question, when it comes to asking the question about, you know, what's in it for me? You know, what are we gonna get out of this? I'd say, you know, I'll be really honest with you. I don't know. Ask her. They're doing the research. And they'll give you answers based on small numbers as to whether there's a performance improvement in an athlete if you alter their sleep patterns, okay? So that's a scientific question to answer. So if we leave that aside, because I don't know the answer to that, and I've seen many athletes win world championships and gold medals, but no freaking sleep. Worst sleepers in the world have won gold medals at the Olympics, because I see them. So trust me, I'm not convinced it makes a damn bit of difference, just so you know, okay? But if we look at the overall general health, because I'm a doctor and that's my job, and then if I'm looking at athletes, I'd say, well, you know, like the first diagram, I think we do have to pay attention to their sleep for a variety of reasons. And if we look at overtraining, which was my original interest in all of this, just overtraining, what's the role of sleep, I think that you, you know, when you have kids go along chronically with sleep difficulty, they get depressed. And you see this a lot in athlete populations. And so um, I would say with the 30%, we've got it wired. Educate them, because education's good anyway. For the ones that are bad, get them help. And the ones in the middle, not sure. I don't know if that answers the question. But I'm not convinced. I will be honest with you. I am not convinced that from a true winning perspective, there's any difference because I don't know anyone that's been able to study this. You guys, do you know the researchers? No, so we don't know, okay? And I'm not willing to just say, oh, you gotta sleep or you won't win. I'm not willing to say that at all, okay? Whoa, that's a lot of questions all at once. And so I think, I think the point I've tried to make is that you can look at those issues and sit down. So I have a whole bunch of slides from the work we did with the Calgary Flames. Um, and again, I get to work with losing teams. So that's why I'm not convinced that sleep stuff makes any difference at all. Okay, if you, anyone watched the Junior National Championship hockey this winter? We spent, we spent one year working with that team and they totally blew it, you know, so whatever. And we had the best NHL players there because of the lockout, you know, so I'm not convinced I have any usefulness. So I think we could sit down with teams and look at those strategies because you have to be careful. You can't be shifting the kids all over the place, right? So if you predominantly play at night, so hockey's a night game, right? It's always in the same sort of seven to nine, depending on where you are in the country. Well, we can strategize around that, actually and we can give them strategies for when they're traveling. And the napping strategy is the key. So in hockey, they have a terrible napping culture of like three, four hour afternoon naps pregame. Do you guys have that in your sports? Soccer, or sorry, football? No? Yeah, because hockey's horrible. You know, it's just ridiculous what they do. But it's embedded in the culture. You're never gonna change it. Not in a million years are you gonna change that. So I would say there's, there's value in looking at that. 
Um, but you'd have to sort of, I, I couldn't answer that question specifically. Okay. Anything else? Yep. In one athlete. In one athlete. After two or three days of training, and after we have a phobia from training and uh, problem. Uh, we see that it was uh, maybe uh, that name is um, Meridian Syndrome. And uh, Meridian Syndrome is from the Meridian. That when you go more than two Meridians, oh, okay. we, have, we have this, this disorder. This sleep disorder. Um, I'm not. Male or female? Male? A male athlete? Male. And so you have an eating disorder in a male athlete? Soccer player? Okay. Okay. And it was, you moved two time zones? One time. Okay. Okay, and and the que your question is I'm not quite clear on what your question is because that's pretty complicated. But my question is, is there is one syndrome or, or there is the other the other syndrome okay. view of the So I think if the if the person has that many problems and there's an eating disorder, I'm immediately suspicious that there's an underlying psychiatric illness that's there all the time. And when you have that, you've got a host of other problems associated with that one of which would be sleep disturbance. So I would want to know what they're like at home. So do, does this person struggle to sleep at home? Yes or no? Yes? So again, the value of sleep screening, you're going to detect that. Or they're going to be detected because they have an eating disorder and they're seeing a psychiatrist anyway. And so when you have that complicated a situation, that, I mean, to me, you want to manage the sleep. We do this with the athletes who have psychiatric illness so that we minimize the impact when they travel, for instance. But also, we manage the sleep in those athletes because we want to train them. And these, these are athletes, so we see swimmers who are sort of on the borderline of depression, and then they start slipping off, and then you can't train them, and it becomes a cycle. So what I find is the trainers, the doctors, and the coaches will come to me and go, look, you know, we can just see this athlete slipping. And here's the baseline problem. They don't sleep. Fix the sleep. Okay. And then we sort of look at everything. Does that help, Ann? Yeah, and then you're dealing, then we get the psychologist, because there's something about these people traveling. Maybe it's the meridians, but I, I do doubt that. Because, I mean, it's just not that big a distance for it to make that big a difference, in my view. But the other thing is, when athletes travel, are they staying in hotel rooms alone or with others? That has a huge impact on the athletes, especially the ones with problems. Okay. Anything else? Yeah.
So that's a, that's a good question because it really gets, we would use, the physiotherapists are our front line and the trainers, right? So we want them to be sort of asking the athletes how they're doing. And of course, part of that is how do you cope with travel and are you sleeping okay? And so you're gonna get the answer, I'm not sleeping. And then you have to have a, a plan as to what you're going to do. And that's why we do the screening because we can detect where they fit on the scale. And if it looks like there's really a problem, we'll get them help. Otherwise, we'll reassure them. But you are given the tools to start the process of educating them. So we would actually ask you to begin the process of educating the athlete, not refer them, start the process. Because these are skills that you can do. Because you're a physiotherapist. I mean, you can do this stuff. Well, I don't think the sport physiologist is someone who can treat sleep problems, nor would they say they could. So you're really dealing in the realm of a clinical thing, so the psychologist or the sport doctor. Or, and, you know, what we do is we go in and give each, each team gets an education package so they know what to do, you know. They know how to manage it with the athlete, okay. which I think is the whole idea of what we're doing. Yeah, is that right? Okay, great, okay. So do you want to do your talk, and then I can do the travel stuff after? Uh, oh, because of the computer. Uh, yeah. right. I'm, I'm just worried these guys are getting bored of me. OK. So we, with, with travel and jet lag, um, I want to give you, a, a, again, a, a framework to conceptualize what we're talking about here. and. Um, it's really important to break it down into jet lag and travel fatigue, in my view. Okay, so jet lag is one thing, okay, and travel fatigue is another thing. And then, of course, they do interact, all right? And so you have to look at these four elements that go into affecting a human being or an athlete when they're traveling. And so the direction of travel and the distance of travel equates to a time zone differential, and that can be jet lag, okay? And it is predominantly a circadian factor. So right now, I could have all the sleep I need from coming from Calgary, but it's still mid-afternoon, and I'd like to be sleeping, okay? Because that's my circadian clock telling me it's mid-afternoon or midnight. It's nighttime, and I should be sleeping. So I'm going to be tired even though I've got all the sleep I need on the plane and whatnot. So that's a circadian factor. And of course, when it comes to sport performance, that's critical. If you take an athlete and displace them into a new time zone and ask them to perform and their circadian clock is out of whack, like their brain is at 2 in the morning and it's, you know, 9 o'clock in the morning, that's not going to be good. They're not going to be very alert, even if they're well rested from the amount of sleep that they got. So that's a jet lag or circadian factor. And then here, the frequency of travel and then the length of the season affect the recovery window, and that's travel fatigue. Okay, so it's a cumulative decrease in recovery, and I'm talking about recovery from travel. So, you know, hockey players have an 80-game season, but they travel within North America, let's say. So there are short distances, and soccer would be the same, or football would be the same for you guys and other sports where you have a high frequency of travel, a high frequency of games, but not long distances necessarily, okay? And so it's a cumulative effect, and that's very important, and that's often ignored, is just the chronic fatigue that accumulates from travel, okay? So I think you have to distinguish between these two things to the best of your ability to determine what's going on with your athletes, and of course, with travel fatigue, you can do all sorts of things to mitigate the fatigue to the best of your ability when you're managing a team or athletes. And you have to take into consideration the distance, the direction, the frequency, and the length of the season when you're doing this, okay? So first and foremost, with all of your athletes, in my view, you have to know what their sleep phase is. So screening the athletes becomes important. You want to find the night owls because they're going to respond to your management strategies totally different from people who are neutral sleepers and larks, people who are the morning people, all right? 
So with that information, that helps, okay? You have to, deter you have to help them understand that the pre-trip state is critical. So how many athletes do you know when they're planning a trip or, or move, you know, get on the plane rested? Very few athletes get on an airplane rested. Okay? And that's critical. Keeping the sleep debt down prior to a trip is very important. Okay? Tapering their training routines prior to a trip is important. Now again, keep that it's different when you have high frequency travel and professional teams. You have to look at the number of time zones and we de generally, generally say it's one day uh, per time zone recovery, but that depends on whether you're going east or west. Traveling west, we adapt a lot quicker, not a lot quicker, a little bit quicker than going east. Okay? And so in Canada, so I'm, just to give you an example, it's three time zones east to Halifax from Calgary, for instance, we would consider probably will experience some degree of jet lag or circadian malalignment and four time zones west. So for instance, Anchorage, we would expect to have some experience of uh, circadian misalignment. So you can go further west. It's easier for humans to go west. Okay? So we break it down and it's been broken down at Waterhouse and Riley did this many, many years ago and gave us a format of pre-flight plan, flight plan, and then the arrival plan. And so basically what we do with the teams is we tell them we would like a one to two week window. We usually get two days. We give them a very strict routine on the airplane of what to follow, and they each get a little package with their eye shades and earplugs and all of their travel stuff. They have, we talk to them about pillows, being comfortable, all these things and uh, minimizing their work on a computer and a cell phone, using, the, using their uh, uh, um, iPods to listen to music, to relax. And I'm a big fan of meditation and relaxation. And I actually do think that it's important for changing um, states of arousal and allowing the athlete to get some degree of recovery from just that meditative state. And again, no research, but I do think it's very important getting them to get their state of arousal down, use the travel as an opportunity to recover. Okay? Their arrival plan is 24 to 48 hours, depending on how far they go, and it's a combination of light and dark exposure, depending on where they're going. They'll have a sad light, okay? and their uh, light blocking glasses. Okay? And then the second day, they'll have a routine for their light and dark exposure. They'll have strategic napping, and then training, We'll give them advice about training and then eating as well. And so, for instance, this would be, a, this was pre-2010. Uh, this is the routine that we gave the athletes for their light therapy. And depending on the number of time zones, the direction of travel, and the wake-up time, we give them. And there's calculators to do this. Now, we're, we're going to get even more sophisticated now. We're going to... We're, we're going to type the athletes because we have the data now on each athlete and give them an estimated temperature minimum, which is in the middle of the night, their lowest core body temperature. So I do actually think that cold uh, ther uh, um, therapy plays a role in bringing their state of arousal down, recovery, and also putting them into a nicer state for sleep. And there's a, there's a direct relationship between melatonin secretion and core body temperature. So at your lowest core body temperature, your nadir, is your peak of melatonin secretion. So physiologically, that's the midpoint of your physiological sleep phase. And so we estimate that based on their routine at home. And then we can give them very specific um, advice about when to have light therapy and when to take melatonin when they're traveling. And so that's sort of our next phase of travel planning for our athletes. Okay. And we give them this uh, advice, so minimize sleep debt prior to travel, rest, sleep during travel, hydrate, obviously, 24 to 48 hours of re recovery. So I don't know what your routines are like, but ours were just terrible. So we had athletes on the national ski teams arriving in uh, Europe, getting in a car, driving four hours, and getting on the hill the next morning. And this is, you, you, this is fraught with injury, and it's dangerous and just really poor behaviors. 
And so we're trying to educate the teams and the coaches about how to take that first 48 hours upon arrival and use that time to get yourself adjusted and, and consider the safety factors of getting off a plane and driving four hours um, after a seven or nine hour flight, depending on where you're coming from. Okay. And so this would be the individual's plan. So their, their sort of basic plan, what they do at home. And then this is a paper that uh, was published in the uh, Clinical Journal of Sport Medicine last year. And it gives very specific advice and it's broken down into the direction of travel and the number of time zones and very specific advice about pharmacolo pharmacological recommendations, circadian phase shifting, managing jet lag symptoms, okay, for jet lag and then also for travel fatigue. And so that's as good as it gets to give you very specific advice. It was written for sport docs and it, it's, it's not as detailed as we would do with the melatonin and the light therapy but it's just short of that. And so it's written for you guys. And that's in the uh, Clinical Journal of Sport Medicine. So just to give you an example, this is the, the uh, playoff schedule for the Calgary Flames in 2011. And so we take their schedule and their flight plan. And I'm just showing you sort of what. And then we start to make, we make up this routine for them. And it's done in an Excel spreadsheet, just like a periodization schedule uh, for training. And it tells them exactly what to do when, when they're traveling. And that's, that's what we do for all of the teams um, uh, in, in, uh, in the Olympic system. And this just happened to be an, an example that I could show you from uh, the uh, Calgary Flames during a playoff uh, season. Or the, this was the Canucks. And this was as bad as it gets in North America. So you have Boston and Vancouver in the playoffs traveling back and forth across the country in two weeks to play a seven game final series. Okay. So we're preparing for Sochi and this is what we do for the teams. Um, all of the docs have now got the paper. They read it. They get a good understanding of jet lag and travel fatigue, understanding the differences, being able to sort of uh, watch out for that with the athletes. And then we give them their plan. And I, I won't go through it in detail because it's not relevant to you guys, but it's, it's all of the si things that I've just explained to you in an easy to understand because this kind of stuff is, is complicated. And sport docs, they just don't want to pay attention to all of the circadian stuff. They just tell me what to do, when to do it. All of the teams have satellites, the lights, for adjusting the clocks and we have uh, drug tested melatonin for all of the teams and this would be a typical depending on when they're going to wake up we give them a routine okay and that's it thanks i hope that's helpful would you add anything to the travel stuff you sure yeah okay